Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? This ain't murder three. Strange things did happen here. No stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree? Welcome to Strange Things, broadcasting from the Raimundo Rios Mayo Library in Arkansas. And welcome to Strange Things. I'm your host, Chris James. This will be season number one, episode 20, September 10th, 2016. Tonight, we'll be discussing a little known treasure here in Texas. It's referred to as the Spider Rock Treasure. And once we get into the story, you'll understand fully why that was what it was called. Hidden in the unforgiving earth of central Texas were clues, archaic clues scratched upon buried rocks, stacked as artifacts upon other clues, or carved into rock walls. These century-old clues placed to lead Spaniards back to their catch eventually formed an intricate web which lured treasure seekers and captured them in its mystery. The question still remains, has the spider rock treasure ever been found? Back when the conquistadors were storming about the new world, looking for gold and silver to haul back to Europe, to fill the coffers of themselves and whichever royalty had sent them on their quest, the Aztecs were a ready source of treasure. Spaniards also sent out prospecting parties to look for the source of all that gold held by the Aztecs. Along with precious metals, copper and lead were much sought after. You could make all kinds of things out of copper, and they needed the lead to make musket balls, and they needed the musket balls to conquer the Aztecs. Along with Precious metals, uh, correction, uh, the Double Mountain and the Brazos River Fork is a, it's a short, uh, the Brazos River is short for Las Brazos de Dios, in the Spanish for the arms of God. Numerous abandoned mines and smelting operations have been found in this area. Way back in 1902, a rotund man came riding into Haskell, Texas, which is just 50 miles north of Abilene and 180 miles west of Fort Worth. Being so big, you'd have a narrow, you have to narrow it down. That's the state. Well-fed man was Dave Arnold. He hailed from Missouri, but he owned a ranch near San Angelo, Texas. He had come to Haskell for the purpose of conferring with Dr. Caleb Terrell. Dr. Terrell had a map passed on to him by one of his patients. Back then, you sometimes had to barter for services. Somehow, Arnold had heard about the map and had come hoping to see it. The map looked nothing like any treasure map. Dots and circles, some in patterns, some just haphazardly scribbled about the page. Arnold had a map of his own drawn on a piece of shipskin. But he didn't like sharing. He told the doctor just what he needed to to convince the doctor to cooperate. Somehow, the two came to an agreement, and the treasure hunt was on. Dr. Terrell was to finance the expedition, and Arnold was to do the legwork. The soon-to-be-acquired treasure was to be shared equally. People were a lot more trusting back then. Now, using the two maps, Arnold was able to maneuver through the central Texas landscape and find a rock with an inscription on it. This led him to another rock with more writing. Working from a ranch house where Arnold had struck a deal, room and board for a share of the treasure, a work party began digging up the ground near the salt fork of the Brazos River. The work party consisted of Arnold, Dr. Terrell, a goat herder who was not named, who had come up from Mexico, 
and my, nine men from around the area who all had vested interests in the hunt. They began excavating the area, shown on the two maps. Arnold would confer with the goat herder about the coded inscriptions on the map only he and the herder ever got to look at. At about three feet, they unearthed a flat rock, which was pulled up from the ground. Under it lay three copper objects, a dagger, a key, and a square with notches carved along one edge. Hidden beneath the copper artifacts was a stone with a unique pattern carved into its surface. The pattern looked very much like a spider web, with numbers scribed around the edges. This rock was first called the Wheel of Fortune, but due to the image on the rock, it became known as the Spider Rock. Surprisingly, Arnold was looking for just such a rock. He knew it was out there, he just wasn't sure where. The copper pieces each had cryptic engravings on them. By using skill and some guesswork, Arnold deciphered where to take the search next. They moved down the river to their next dig site. The Mexican goat herder told Arnold they needed to dig down further where they would find a wall and the bodies of the slaves, buried so their spirits would guard the treasure map. They would also find the bones of some unknown giant animal. The men dug down where the map indicated and found a wall made from hardened mud, and then they found the bodies. No one bothered to count how many there were. The bones were mixed together, and no one took the time to investigate the burial site. They weren't there as archaeologists. They were there for the gold. As for the unknown animal, it is believed they may have found a leg bone from a mastodon or some other ancient beast that roamed the earth thousands of years ago. Along with the ancient bones, they found a Spanish sword, two ornate silver epaulets, those are the things officers had on their shoulders to tell the world that they were officers, and a handful of silver ornaments. They found some glass beads and 42 gold buttons strung out in a row. The buttons pointed the way to their next work site. Now one of the men working on the, the dig site had found a copper plate about 7 inches long and 3 inches wide and this had been buried on his property on the other side of the river. The plate had more etchings that resembled the spider rock. There's also a copper piece referred to as the leaf. This was unearthed. All the copper pieces were placed together in various arrangements, trying to figure out how they would affect the use of the spider rock map. Dr. Terrell's son made paper copies of all the copper pieces and had them pinned together in what was hoped to be the correct order and orientation of their discovery. The goat herder stepped off in the direction the saber had been pointing. As he walked, he began to unearth round clay balls at regular intervals. Like the dots, line, the dotted line leading to the next clue. Kind of the same way the buttons had been laid out. The layout of the clay balls coincided with markings on one of the maps. They led the treasure hunters to a hillside. This hill looked man-made. We're going to pause here for a few commercials and station identification. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. You're listening to Arkanasa Radio. Do you have skin? Would you like to take better care of it? Call Lourdes James, Independent Beauty Consultant, and set up an appointment. Call 
If your vision isn't what it used to be, and you're not sure you're seeing Bigfoot or just your neighbor mowing his lawn, stop on by Del Norte Optical, 107 Calle Del Norte, just across the street from the Embassy Suites. You should be able to see what you're looking at. Looking for a great cup of coffee? Swing on by the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 1002 Eaterby Day, suite number 7. Not a coffee drinker? They have hot chocolate, hot tea, and sometimes muffins and cookies. It's a great place to meet your friends for a conversation or curl up in the corner with a good book. The Organic Man Coffee Trike. Life is too short to drink bad coffee. If you're in the neighborhood of the Organic Man Coffee Trike this evening at 7 o'clock, Lourdes James will be reading excerpts from her book on poetry. That begins at 7 o'clock this evening, so swing on by and listen up. Oh, we gotta say goodbye. No, don't say goodbye. Stay with us. This is Arcanelza Radio. Quédate con nosotros, estás escuchando Arcanaza Radio. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. Welcome back to the show. This evening we're talking about the Spider Rock Treasure. But before we begin... The Laredo Paranormal Research Society would like to invite you to the second annual Mall del Norte Halloween Party, October 22, 2016. The El Prieres will be hosting the Halloween-themed car show, a case review of some of their most spectacular investigations, and the movie Ghost Goosebumps. Festivities will begin at 3 p.m. and finish up around 11. Bring the whole family to Mall del Norte, October 22nd, 2016. The hill that the treasure hunters had been looking at it appeared to be man-made, so they decided it would be man-removed. Along with some draft animals and earth-moving equipment, they began the arduous task of digging up and removing this hill of dirt. The dirt was hauled away and dumped over a bluff. As they dug, the workers began finding replicas of the spider rock. Only these had been etched into the bedrock. Working fast and hard, the workers may have destroyed clues needed to find the treasure. They stopped clearing the bedrock and began digging shafts that would be the approximation of the symbols on the map. One shaft came up empty, but the other yielded two human skulls, set back to back. One was facing the excavation site, and the other one was facing in the northwestern direction. More clay balls were found, and the treasure hunt was switched to what was hoped to be a tunnel. The tunnel was supposed to lead them to a treasure room. The workers were so sure the treasure was near, They began wearing sidearms at all times. As the dig went on, Arnold would sometimes ride off into the surrounding brush in search of some unknown and unshared clue only he could find. He was great at finding these clues, but he wasn't so good at deciphering them. The goat herder was great at deciphering clues, but as time passed, The treasure hunters began to suspect he was not giving them the full story. They began to distrust him as much as he seemed to distrust them. The goat herder just didn't much care for these armed men hanging around the dig site. It's funny what the promise of gold will do to people. At one point, Several of the workers spotted 
what appeared to be companions of the goat herder, running away through an arroyo, carrying some unknown object. They had something wide and heavy gripped between them. Chasing people in the dark was not on their schedule, so the workers stayed at their camp. The work was directed back to where earlier they had been removing the man-made hill. The herder said it was time to stop and they would continue in the morning. The next morning, the herder was nowhere to be found. But someone had been digging at the site during the night and they had removed something from the excavation. Shortly thereafter, human remains were found nearby. They were believed to be the missing shepherd. There were two copper vessels found with him. Both were very heavy and could have held some kind of a heavy cargo, like maybe gold. There were buggy tracks leading away from the body. In 1903, there was no CSI to call, and no one was really that concerned about finding a dead body. Times were hard. Life was hard. People died around, and not much was thought of it. The idea of contacting the local authorities just never came up. They simply buried the body and went on about their business. Now that Arnold didn't have anyone to interpret the clues he was able to find, he sought the assistance of a psychic. There's no real record of who he contacted or what deal was made, but they brought the psychic out to the dig site. Two shafts were dug at the instructions of this psychic, down to about a hundred feet, but they found nothing. The treasure hunt ground to a halt. Arnold continued his above-ground search, finding a grave with a bizarre occupant. The body was found, along with a donkey, sitting up, facing east. It's an odd way to inter someone, but it had to be a clue. Arnold was busy exploring the vast wilderness of Texas and didn't let his fellow hunters in on all of his dealings. He was known to hunt for clues in Comanche County, which is 150 miles southeast of Haskell. It has been theorized Arnold wasn't as lost as he pretended to be while in the company of his fellow searchers. No one was allowed to see his sheepskin map. Around 1903, a young girl was wandering around her family farm, looking to see what might be found. She stumbled upon a pile of stones, supporting one big stone. It looked something like a grave. The stones were not from anywhere around the area. Next to the mock grave were three trees that had been braided together and grew into one huge tree. She told her family about her discovery during dinner, and then it was relegated to just some weird thing. Round 1905, two men drove up to the Sembritsky farm, looking for a meal and a place to sleep. One of these men was Arnold. As the family shared the dinner with the two guests, the conversation got around to if anyone had seen any weird or bizarre markings in or around the farm. The young girl conveyed her discovery from three years previous. Arnold said he'd been following a trail of markers that had led them to his house, to their house. He would have charged out into the night in search of the false grave and braided trees if not for the late hour and cold weather. By morning, snow had fallen, putting any plans of treasure hunt on hold. The car driver returned to his home, leaving Arnold to huff and puff, waiting to get to the mystery marker. Arnold told the family he'd been following a trail from Mexico to their front door and he was convinced there was a vast treasure buried on their land. He never mentioned his last few years of digging up the Salt Fork area or the men who had been working with him. He said he would split the booty with them, seeing as it was on their property, but only he held the key. A deal was struck. 
Arnold went so far as to actually show this family his sheepskin map. At long last, the young girl led Arnold to the fake grave site. He got down on his knees and looked for marks he was now very familiar with. Sighting along some mysterious markers, he announced the next clue was so many varas away. A vara, which means rod or pole, is an old Spanish unit of measure. Varas are a surveying unit that appear in many deeds in the southern United States, and varas were also used in many parts of Latin America. It varies in size at various times and places. The Spanish unit was set at about 32.91 inches, or just about 33 inches. He was able to follow a set of markings away from the false grave. Tree trunks would have circles or curved lines cut into them. Sometimes it would be a straight line or maybe a crescent moon. Arnold could decipher the clues, but he neglected to fill any of the family in on their meaning or his discoveries. Arnold had told the family he was 70 years old. He was more like about 56 at the time, but he did this so he could ask them to help him dig. He would find a location, then ask the farmer to excavate a hole or two, sometimes three. Once the farmer, John Sabritsky, had more tasks to do to maintain his farm, he left Arnold to fend for himself. Arnold was more than capable of digging holes. At long last, Arnold uncovered a new clue. Under an oak tree, he found a flat rock. This one was very much like the original spider rock, but the etchings were showing a different map. The rock had been planted, and then the tree had been placed on top of it. So when the tree grew, the rock was firmly held in the roots of the huge oak tree. It took Arnold and John considerable time to free this rock from under the tree. Arnold said the Spanish had built an underground complex and filled it with gold, tons of gold. When the local Indian tribe attacked, the Spanish had flooded the underground rooms using a nearby stream. All this was supposed to have happened in 1731. Arnold convinced John they were drawing close to the treasure. He neglected to mention the first spider rock or any of his previous work. Like I said, Arnold was not big on sharing anything that he knew. Using the latest spider rock, Arnold instructed John to dig at a certain location. In the bottom of this hole, they found a stone carved that looked like a duck and it was sitting atop three round rocks that looked like eggs. From there, Arnold determined the site for the next dig. Once more, John dug a hole and found a rock with a carving on it that looked like the setting sun. Clues and more clues. This reminded me of National Treasure, where they would find a map that would lead them to another map, which led them to a cipher, which led them to another map. From there, the next excavation brought up a copper disc with writing on it. The writing said Puente, which is Spanish for bridge. Still another hole was dug. This one produced a copper dagger with a blade pointed down. Arnold had figured that this meant they had to dig down deeper, so down they went. At about three feet, they found the top of a clay arch. When exposed, this arch stood about five feet high and is two feet wide. Where did this arch lead? Nowhere. There was nothing but dirt beyond the clay edifice. Someone had gone to the bother of digging down into the dirt, creating this clay archway, filled the clay archway with sand, and then buried the whole thing in the dirt again. Why would anybody go through that much trouble unless whatever they were guarding was an enormous treasure? 
Arnold came to realize he was going to need more men to dig, so this meant he was going to need more money. Time to go see his old gang. Arnold didn't much like the idea of bringing in most of the former Spider Rock crew. He only talked to Dr. Terrell and his son Cade. The rest of the searchers were left out of his new development. Arnold, somehow, got the new treasure hunters to agree he would not have to pay any bills accrued by the company, and he didn't have to do any of the physical work. He would be free to run about the wilderness, looking for more clues, new sites to excavate. What a deal. The new treasure hunting company found three items practically immediately, all made out of copper, two daggers and a plate about six inches across. The plate was notched and engraved. They also uncovered a smelter where all the copper items had been formed. Tailings and copper remnants were found nearby. Arnold spent most of his time moving back and forth between the first location where Spider Rock No. 1 was found and the new site where Spider Rock No. 2 was uncovered. The diggers did find one thing of value. At 29 feet, they hit water. John Sabritsky had attempted to sink a well on numerous occasions but always came up dry. Arnold managed to at least bring a water supply to the farm. In the latter part of 1905, the treasure hunters lost the lease on property number one, where the first spider rock had been found. So now Arnold turned his focus to the number two site. At time, as time crawled on without any gold to help with expenses, the excavation, the executive members of the team sought a new partner to bring in some much needed revenue. Another doctor was signed on who was willing to foot the bill for a time. The new addition to the team was hoping to be allowed to look at the sheepskin map and try to interpret it, but Arnold wasn't having any of that. No one laid eyes on his precious possession, aside from the Sturbinsky family, and Arnold was more than happy to take other people's money, but he kept all the clues to himself. John Sabrinsky was having issues with Arnold as well. You see, John was nearly deaf, and he had a really heavy German accent. So Arnold did most of his conversing with John's wife. Lots of conversing. And John began to worry that they were doing more than just conversing. Now, there's no evidence that anything bad ever happened between Arnold and John's wife, but... Back then, John was a little paranoid, and I guess Arnold didn't do anything to alleviate his fears. This led to all kinds of bad feelings amongst the workers. We are going to take a brief pause here, play a few commercials, a little station identification. We'll be right back after this, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. You're listening to Arkanasa Radio. Do you have skin? Would you like to take better care of it? Call Lourdes James, independent beauty consultant, and set up an appointment. Call 723-3019. If your vision isn't what it used to be, and you're not sure you're seeing Bigfoot or just your neighbor mowing his lawn, stop on by Del Norte Optical, 107 Calle Del Norte, just across the street from the Embassy Suites. You should be able to see what you're looking at. Looking for a great cup of coffee? Swing on by the Organic Man Coffee Track, 1002 Eaterby Day, Suite Number 7. Not a coffee drinker? 
They have hot chocolate, hot tea, and sometimes muffins and cookies. It's a great place to meet your friends for a conversation or curl up in the corner with a good book. The Organic Man Coffee Trike. Life is too short to drink bad coffee. And don't forget, tonight, Lourdes James will be reading some of her poetry. The festivities will begin at 7 p.m. at the Organic Man Coffee Trike. So swing on by and listen up. No, don't say goodbye. Stay with us. This is Arcanelza Radio. Quédate con nosotros. Estás escuchando Arcanaza Radio. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. Welcome back. Just want to take a few moments to tell you the 15th anniversary a Texas Bigfoot conference kicks off in just five weeks. Meet all the people you've seen on TV. Craig Woolheater, Ken Gerhardt, Nick Redfern, Lyle Blackburn, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, just to mention a few. October 15th in historic Jefferson, Texas. Make plans to attend. Don't miss out. The Texas Bigfoot conference. Just look for Texas Bigfoot Research Center on your computer for more details. We were talking about how tensions were beginning to rise between Arnold and John Sembrinsky. Something to do with John thought maybe Arnold was paying a little too much to his attention to his wife. Sembrinsky and some of the other treasure hunters sent notification to Arnold and both doctors in an attempt to dissolve the search company. Too much work and not enough to show for it. Plus, those doing all the work were tired of digging while other people gave orders. Through some negotiating skills and promises of riches, the search company managed to stay together for a while. A new contract and better bookkeeping helped settle some of the ruffled feathers. Unfortunately, Arnold was stuck. He found himself in the same place he'd been in at the Spider Rock No. 1 dig site. So, Arnold brought in someone from south of the border. Someone who had a better handle on Spanish and could interpret the maps much more thoroughly. In fact, he brought in one after another in an attempt to find the treasure. All the men from Mexico said the same thing. After looking at the mysterious sheepskin map and then the two spider rock maps, they all came to the same conclusion. The treasure was cursed, and Arnold, nor any of his cohorts, would ever acquire it. This was not what any of them wanted to hear. Once again, tensions rose. The workers began to show up for work armed. Along with their picks and shovels, the men wore pistols to the dig site. People were getting to not trust their fellow workers. By January of the next year, work had come to a lackluster crawl. Arnold had left for Stonewall County, and the others were digging haphazardly, just about any place that caught their eye. No one was running the show by then. The workers would pick up a shovel, walk 10, 20, or 30 paces away from the dig site, and start another hole. As far as anyone knows, none of them found anything worth digging for. Arnold came back to the Sembrinsky farm to try his luck again. This time the youngest daughter went with him out to look for clues. They came to an oak tree with markings on it, this led to another tree with different markings, which led to another tree. In a hollow space inside of this tree, Arnold pulled out a handful of copper trimmings, which he gave to the young girl. 
Later they tried digging around the base of the tree, but they found nothing. On Arnold's last visit to the farm, he asked if he could examine the second spider rock. All of the articles that they had dug up so far was being stored there on the Sombritsky farm, seeing as it was their property, the things found all belonged to them. It wasn't until later, after Arnold had left, that the family discovered Arnold had taken all of the artifacts with him, leaving them with nothing to show for the year-long hunt. Arnold was never seen around their property again. From that on, point on, work at the Sembrinsky Ranch was left to a few men who still held out hopes of finding the treasure. They went so far as to bring in another psychic to visit the site. She pointed out some possible spot to check, but nothing was uncovered. I don't want you to get the impression that I don't believe in psychics. I work with several psychics, and they know what they're doing. But for some mysterious reason, when you start bringing psychics around treasure hunts, around piles of gold, around huge quantities of valued minerals, their readings get screwed up somehow. Perhaps this is what was happening to the psychics brought out to the dig sites. The clues, the, the minerals themselves, maybe the curse would interfere with their ability to, to function correctly. Now all those missing artifacts that Arnold had taken from the Zembrinsky farm were secreted away in Dr. Terrell's safe back in Haskell. A mining interest got wind of the supposed hidden treasure on the Zembrinsky farm after a newspaper article mentioned the work that had been done in the past year. The mining company signed a lease with John and began their hunt for either treasure or mineable minerals one of the interested parties was named Ward. At some point, the subject was discussed on how Arnold had been able to find clues riding around the farm. The descriptions of all the artifacts got screwed and distances and directions became manufactured, but the hunt went on. By the end of the second year, Ward was taking full credit for finding the first spider rock interpreting all of the hidden directions, finding the second spider rock, locating the clay archway, and a few other things that he'd really had nothing to do with. Now this may have been done in an attempt to raise much needed cash to continue working the dig site. A digging a hole in the dirt with a shovel doesn't cost a whole lot of money, but if you bring in 10, 12, 15 men, you have to feed them and take care of their needs, and then get them to dig holes in the dirt, suddenly you start spending money. That was one thing the Spider Rock Treasure was good at, spending money. On May 8th, 1909, the Terrell Pharmacy caught fire and burned to the ground. Nothing too suspicious there. All the articles, as well as the two Spider Rock maps, were supposed to have been destroyed. This is kind of odd. See, Dr. Terrell had built a huge masonry vault in the rear of his pharmacy with an iron door. It was supposed to be burglar, weather, and fireproof. So how is it the contents of the safe were destroyed? We'll talk about that a little more later on. Getting back to Ward... He somehow was managing to follow Arnold, although it's not certain as to how. Arnold would dig at a ranch or a farm for a few months, pack up and leave. Then Ward would show up, the same property, and begin digging as well. Ward did manage to make a copy of one of the Spider Rock maps, which was a tracing made by Arnold and left at one of the ranches. Ward soon ran out of money and was forced to seek employment. He did go out from time to time in an effort to find what he just knew was only one hole away. And Arnold was still running about digging in at least two sites, the one at the Brazos River and one called the Lana Grande. 
He did contact the Terrell family one more time, but the Terrells had had enough treasure hunting. The doctor had died. The son had become disillusioned. None of the members of the family really much cared for hanging around with Arnold and digging holes in the ground, so the Terrell family decided to call treasure hunting quits. Arnold did follow his clues as he traveled about the Texas wilderness. He would find small piles of rocks that gave what kind of looked like a dotted line running out across the scrubland. He seemed to be blessed with the ability to find them where others could not. Now, his blessing could also have been called a curse because he spent his entire life following clues that kept him possessed but never rendered any absolution. At some point in his latest quest, Arnold found a third spider rock map. Like the others, it had what looked like a spider web with cryptic lettering and numbers on both sides. Around 1912, gold was found. One gold bar was pulled from a dried up water hole. The bar was marked with a V for Viceroy and a cross. Real live Spanish treasure. The bar was split amongst the searchers, which gave each man about $73, which is about $1,500 in today's market. Around 1915, Dave Arnold vanished from history. No one knows where he went or if he ever found what he was looking for. Around 1920, a man came looking for gold from Oklahoma. Frank Olmsted had heard about the Spider Rock treasure and was just positive he could find it. Now, Olmsted was a college professor and well-to-do businessman. He also had lots of money in the stock market. Olmsted set up camp near the Double Mountain, and he began looking for gold. He found a slab of rock with holes bored into it in various positions. The idea being a stick was to be set into each of these holes, and this would give you an azimuth to follow to the next site. Olmsted had gotten a hold of a copy of the spider rock map and knew he was on to something big. Land was purchased and the hunt was enlarged. It was still a part-time proposition, but the bug was about to bite. 1933, Olmsted sold his farm to invest the money in his treasure hunt. He also took up full-time residence on the site. He built a crude dugout to the side of a cliff. This would do for now and hopefully wouldn't be used for too long. Just a temporary setup. Olmsted began digging trenches at promising locations. He would dig down about 15 feet deep, and then he'd begin trenching in whichever direction caught his fancy. When the trench came in dry, he would simply move his operation over a few yards and begin again. A 15-foot hole, and then a trench. One day, Olmsted discovered that a rabbit had fallen into one of the holes. So Olmsted clomb down into the hole, freed the rabbit, and then he got busy filling in all the holes that no more animals needed rescuing ever again. He seemed to like animals a lot and didn't see any reason to make life hard on them. Olmsted ran out of money. He'd spent everything he had in his treasure quest. This was only a minor inconvenience. He would take a job on a neighbor's farm or ranch to make a little cash, and then it was back to gold hunting once again. November 17, 1948, Olmsted died in his temporary dugout home. He was 63 years old. He was laid to rest in a grave that he himself had dug ten years previous. His grave marker were his pick and shovel, just like the markings on a map depicting a mine. His dugout is still there to see, just as he had left it. 1927, 
an oil field man showed up at the Sembrinsky farm and leased the property so he could use drilling equipment to search for the treasure. After months of work, the oil rig was packed up and hauled away. Nothing was found. We're going to take a brief pause here, play a couple commercials, station identification. We'll be right back, so don't go anywhere after this. You're listening to Arkanasa Radio. Do you have skin? Would you like to take better care of it? Call Lourdes James, independent beauty consultant, and set up an appointment. Call 723-3019. If your vision isn't what it used to be, and you're not sure you're seeing Bigfoot or just your neighbor mowing his lawn, stop on by Del Norte Optical, 107 Calle Del Norte, just across the street from the Embassy Suites. You should be able to see what you're looking at. Looking for a great cup of coffee? Swing on by the Organic Man Coffee Trike, 1002 Eaterby Day, Suite Number 7. Not a coffee drinker? They have hot chocolate, hot tea, and sometimes muffins and cookies. It's a great place to meet your friends for a conversation or curl up in the corner with a good book. The Organic Man Coffee Trike. Life is too short to drink bad coffee. And if you're a poetry fan, be sure to swing on by the Organic Man Coffee Trike tonight at 7 p.m. Lourdes James will be reading excerpts from her book on poetry. Well worth listening to. So swing on by the Organic Man Coffee Trike. No, don't say goodbye. Stay with us. This is Arcanelza Radio. Quédate con nosotros, estás escuchando Arcanaza Radio. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. <coughs> and welcome back to the show. Remember, the 15th anniversary Texas Bigfoot Conference will be kicking off in just five weeks. You get to meet all the people you've seen on TV. Craig Woolheater, the founder of the Texas Bigfoot Research Center. Ken Gerhardt, a cryptozoologist up in San Antonio who's been on many TV shows and written a few books. Nick Redfern, famous man from Ancient Aliens and also the author of about 38 books. Lyle Blackburn, the man who brought us the legend of the Boggy Creek. And Dr. Jeff Meldrum will all be in attendance, just to mention a few. October 15th in historic Jefferson, Texas. Make plans to attend. You don't want to miss out. If you'd like to see further details, check out the Texas Bigfoot Conference. Look at Texas Bigfoot Research Center on your computer for more details. Also, the Laredo Paranormal Research Society would like to invite you to the second annual Mall del Norte Halloween Party, October 22, 2016. The LPRS will be hosting a Halloween-themed car show, a case review of some of their more spectacular investigations, and the movie Goosebumps. Festivities will begin at 3 p.m. and finish sometime around 11. Bring the whole family to Mall del Norte, October 22, 2016. Now, getting back to the Spider Rock treasure hunt, around 1930, James and Laura Miller came along with hopes of finding what those before had missed. Once again, Laura was a psychic and just knew she she could succeed where others had failed. They signed an agreement with John and got to work. They brought in men and equipment 
and did all the things necessary to find the hidden gold, everything except actually finding it. After over a year of futile effort, the couple left and went so far as to get a divorce. The curse mentioned by the men from Mexico seemed to be holding true. In 1935, heavy earth-moving equipment was available, and a man named Kessler showed up at the Sembrinsky farm with full intention of doing anything necessary to unearth the gold. He even brought out two heavy-armored cars to transport the gold he was just minutes away from uncovering. He did find what looked like three stone steps, but no gold. After working all summer, Kessler took his bulldozer and grader and headed back home. The two Joes came next. Joe Wood and Joe Cabal. Cobble. They signed a lease agreement with the descendants of John Sombritsky, and they got to work. They brought in a large crane and dug down into the central Texas soil with visions of piles of gold and silver filling their eyes. They dug massive holes and acquired enormous piles of dirt. They did all the things others had done and then some. After six years of toil, the Joes finally had enough. They went home, no gold, no silver, only sore muscles and empty wallets. By 1937, a man named Bill Reed came to try his luck. He spent his time redigging the Salt Fork site. Under a stone ledge, he uncovered a metal arrow. This arrow was made of pure silver, it was about four inches long and half an inch wide. He followed the clues he uncovered for four miles northeast. Somehow he managed to navigate the scrub the same way Arnold had. Digging down at what he hoped would be the mother load, he uncovered a small statuette, about eight inches tall, which is made of silver and gold. He also found a chunk of melted gold and a musket ball. Working the area around the statuette, Reed found a silver drinking cup with the top crushed in on it. Unbending the metal, he dumped out two small nuggets of gold, two silver crosses, and a silver letter V, which was about five inches on each side. The area around this excavation had been cleared and plowed, eliminating any clues that might have been left there. However, Reed did manage to find a lump of gold as big as his thumb. Around the same time, a man named Doc Henderson, who was working his field, found a stone wedged into the fork of a tree. This stone pointed to a large, flat limestone rock. This rock was about three feet by two feet. One end was partially raised, and lettering could be seen under the edge. The rock was covered with letters and numbers. There was what looked like a cooking pot carved on one line, and small holes drilled at various points. Doc planned to return with his brother and see if they could decipher the stone, but when they came back, the stone had been moved by workers clearing the area for farming. The rock was still there, but its orientation had been screwed up. The idea was the small holes would line up to point to the next clue, or perhaps to the actual treasure. Reed was having all the luck Doc was missing. Reed unearthed the second statuette, gold and silver. The statuette had engravings along its back, spelling out the word Norte, or North in Spanish. This statuette also had some gold and musket balls buried with it. More clues led to the site formed by, formed by four rocks laid out in a precise square. Three of the rocks were cut square, while the fourth was carved to look like a hand with the index finger pointing northwest. The hand had writing carved into it, giving the distance to follow. Following this sign, Reed uncovered another silver arrow. The arrow led him to a hollowed-out tree, 
Inside this tree was a small silver ingot that might have belonged to a larger catch, but was overlooked by whoever had found the original treasure. Remember all these artifacts lost during the pharmacy fire? Well, it turned out the safe had actually done its job. Although covered with smoke and some scorch marks, the artifacts had survived until today. The family would pull them out on occasion and look them over, then put the mass back away, still not knowing where the treasure might be hidden. And just a few years ago, in Copper Hill region of Stonewall County, a rancher was out checking his property when he came upon an opening in the side of a hill. A recent rain had washed the dirt away, allowing access to this until now unknown mine. The floor of the mine was awash with furnace slag from an old abandoned Spanish smelting operation. No one can say why the men had worked, who had worked the furnace would go to such lengths to hide the refuse from copper production. Why would they do the extra work to drag all of this refuse into the mine and then bury it? Today there is no record of anyone finding the spider rock treasure. Maybe somebody did and they kept it all to themselves. Perhaps someone found part of the treasure but never reported it to the press. The property is still there, owned by dozens of families. People still show up with maps and clues, bound and determined that they would succeed where everyone else has failed. One thing is sure. A small treasure has been spent looking and many lives have been destroyed in the search for the spider rock treasure. This isn't the only lost treasure in Texas. Now there's supposed to be a pile of gold hidden somewhere around the Alamo. There's a report of a vast treasure amassed by the pirate John Lafitte. A guy I used to know swore he had found the location of the treasure hidden in Armand Bayou Nature Preserve. If it's there, it belongs to the state, seeing as it's a state property. And it's surrounded by alligators who, they're not interested in the treasure, they might decide to make a meal out of anyone looking for it. The Sam Bass is supposed to have hidden his treasure somewhere around Round Rock in the Texas Hill Country. Then there is the Bill Kelly mine, somewhere in the Big Bend area. Lots of gold if you can just find it. Now between 1919 and 1924, the Newton gang would rob 87 banks and 6 trains, taking more loot than the Dalton boys, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and the James gang combined. Of this missing money, it has never been found, even though the Newton brothers themselves hunted for it after their release from prison. Willis said that Jess buried the money on top of a hill, where he dug a hole and put a large rock over it. In court and under oath, Jess had testified that he buried the money somewhere along the Fredericksburg Road, but from what he told his brother Willis, was convinced it was more likely on the road to Bandera, Texas. So if you're ever out in the country, either Fredericksburg Road or in and around Bandera, Texas, look for a hill with a rock on top of it. There just might be some loot buried there. Not that there aren't millions of hills with millions of rocks out in that area. If you're feeling bored and a bit lucky, head on out there and start digging. Just watch out the gold bug doesn't infect you, or the property owner just might shoot at you. If you'd like to read more about the Spider Rock Treasure, check out The Spider Rock Treasure by Steve Wilson, available at Amazon.com. It is well worth the read, and it has far more details than I could possibly go into in this one-hour show. We'll have to go into the Nazi gold train and the missing submarine filled with gold bars at a later date. Next Saturday, the 17th, we'll be talking about the Laredo Paranormal Research Society, 
So tune in and find out some of their more bizarre findings. And hopefully Ishmael Quayer will be in studio to give us the heads up on some of their latest findings. So tune in next Saturday the 17th to Strange Things. Until then, see y'all later. Are you, are you coming to the tree With a strong upper man, the same murder three Strange things that happen here, no stranger would it be If we met at midnight in the hanging tree